Well, good morning, SMC. How are we doing today? It's great to be with you. My name is Timothy Atik, and uh, man, what a great joy to get to start the new year with you guys. I want to start by asking you a question, and when I ask it, I want you to turn to the person next to you and share your answer. Here is the question, who do you believe is the GOAT, the greatest of all time? I'm not going to give you a category. I just want to know what comes out of your heart. Who in this world, who is the GOAT? All right, so instead of talking to your neighbor now, I just want you to yell it at me. Who is the GOAT? So the question, the question is, who is the greatest of all time? And there's a lot of different people in this world who have been considered the GOAT. There's, maybe for you it's Tom Brady or Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Kendrick Lamar, Simone Biles, Taylor Swift. Beyonce, maybe a few of you are like uh, pre-slap Will Smith, I don't know, maybe that was your deal. But the reason that I'm asking the question, who is the goat, is because it's very interesting because Jesus Christ actually weighs in on the topic. I don't know if you know that, but Jesus Christ actually had an opinion about who the goat was. And he makes that clear in this verse in the Bible. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew eleven eleven. He says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, that's everyone, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. So that's interesting. Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, had an opinion on who the goat was. And in his opinion, it was a guy named John who has been known as John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. Now, the reason that I'm even bringing this up is because, look, if Jesus Christ believed that there was someone in the world who was truly living a great life, then I would say that we could benefit a lot from looking at the life of the one that Jesus said was the goat. The, the greatest tragedy, I believe, is to be great in the eyes of the world, but not great in the eyes of God. Like if God has given us a picture of what true greatness can look like in life, then I think that we could benefit from just spending a little time looking at the life of John the Baptist or John the Baptizer, the one that Jesus considered to be the goat, or the greatest of all time. So if you have a Bible, if you brought a Bible, I would invite you to join me in John chapter 1. That's where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to have it on the screens, and so you are more than welcome to just read it from there. If you're new to the Bible or not familiar with it, I just want to put John the Baptist on the map for you. Who are we talking about this morning? Okay, John the Baptist, he was a medical marvel. Why do I say that? I say that because uh, he was born to a mom who was old, wrinkly, and barren. Like, it did not make sense. She was way beyond the point of being able to get pregnant, and she got pregnant miraculously. And so John, he was a medical marvel, and uh, he was... He was, in our day and time, he was a hipster, for sure. Like, he, he lived outside of town. He was kind of doing the hashtag van life kind of deal. He had watched some documentaries, so he didn't eat meat. If you look at the text, he ate, it says, bugs and honey. So that was kind of his niche diet. And he totally would have been an influencer. Like, his clothing, watch this, he, he wore camel hair and a leather belt. Like, that's just a minimalist life, like just camel hair and a belt. That's kind of all he needed. He took an oath not to cut his hair. Some of y'all are living out that oath right now. 
You'll regret it someday when you look back at pictures from today, but it's okay. Lean into it. It'll be fine. He didn't cut his hair. He always said what he was thinking. He always said it, and that's why he ended up dying, because he said what he was thinking. He got arrested and beheaded for calling out the Roman ruler for taking his brother's wife to be his wife. So that's John the Baptist. That's who we're talking about today. And as we look at John the Baptist, here is what I hope you realize. The greatest lives are marked by the greatest clarity. Okay, the greatest lives are marked by the greatest clarity. Here is what I believe to be true of every person in this room right now. I believe that everyone in here desires a great life. Like, I think that there's a desire in everyone's heart for for greatness in some way, shape, or form. Like, I would imagine that very few people in the room are like, you know what, sign me up for mediocrity. You know what sounds really great in life? Being mediocre. Like, I would imagine that very few people are like, you know what, I want a mediocre college experience. I want mediocre friends. I want to have some mediocre girlfriends. You know what, I want to have mediocre date parties, and I want to be a mediocre gamer. That's what I want to be. I want to be really average at gaming. And then I want to graduate and get a mediocre job, and I want to find a mediocre spouse. And together, we're going to have some mediocre kids. And then when I get old, I want to make a mediocre salary and have mediocre grandkids and live in a very mediocre house and die a mediocre death. Like, I would imagine if that's you, come see me afterward. I'd love to talk to you and encourage you. It doesn't have to be that way. But I would imagine that the majority of people in here want want greatness for yourself. You want to live a great life. When you look into the future, you don't envision yourself just settling. But if you want to live a great life, you need to understand that the greatest lives are marked by the greatest clarity. And so here's my hope, my hope for you right here at, in your early 20s, however old you are, between 18 and 24, 25, my hope for you is that in this moment in life, you could leave this week with massive clarity that will shape the trajectory of your life, that you would live a truly great life, not not necessarily in the eyes of other human beings, but a great life in the eyes of God. And so it's going to require you, though, to have clarity on three things. The first thing that you're going to need clarity on is this. Greatness requires clarity on who you are and who you aren't. Greatness requires clarity on who you are and who you aren't. Are you clear on who you are? And are you clear on who you aren't? John the Baptist was a guy who lived with great clarity. Look at the text with me. Look at verse 19. Listen to what it says. It says, and this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? That's an important question. Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Did you see it in the text? John was clear on who he was and who he wasn't. He was very clear. I'm not the Christ. I'm not Elijah. I'm not a prophet. Well, who are you? I'm a voice. I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. He was clear on who he was and who he wasn't. Now, it's really important to understand the historical context of the passage that we're reading especially if you're not very familiar with the Bible. What you need to understand is what we are reading right now, the setting was the first century. You've got Jews who are living under oppression, under Roman rule. And so there was this belief that had formed that a Messiah or a Savior would come. And because Jews were living under oppression, under Roman rule. They had believed that the Messiah would be this political powerhouse that would show up and and rescue them out of 
oppression from Rome, and this Messiah would establish this, this kind of worldwide kingdom where the Jews would really prosper. John the Baptist shows up, and he does something interesting because he shows up and he starts baptizing people. Many people here are familiar with baptism. Maybe you got baptized when you were a baby. Some of you have been baptized in your teens or even in college. But when you think of baptism, you're thinking about something that really only found its significance after Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. Right here, John is baptizing people before Jesus died or rose from the dead. So this is why what John was doing was so weird. The people who got baptized in the first century were non-Jews, known as Gentiles. And the reason they would get baptized is they would uh, submerge themselves in water as a symbol that they were purifying themselves to then join the covenant community of Israel. It's weird that John is baptizing because who does he baptize? He baptizes Jews. He's calling Jews to be baptized. But Jews didn't need to be baptized, at least what they believed in that time. So for John to show up and to call Jews out and say, hey, repent and be baptized, it's as if John is saying, hey, you think you're part of God's people, but you're not actually. And so you need to repent of your sins. You need to be cleansed of your sins. And so when John starts doing something that's very out of the ordinary, it kind of trips off some alarms for what was known as the Jewish Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin. And so they send their minions to kind of figure out, who is this guy? Is this the guy we've been waiting for? So they show up and they just kind of work down their checklist. They're like, hey, John, we got to ask you, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you this political powerhouse that we've been waiting for? And what does John say? No, you got the wrong guy. So then they work their way down their list. They're like, well, then are you Elijah? Because Elijah was this guy in the Old Testament that didn't die, but instead, it's kind of a cool story. He got carried off to heaven by a fiery chariot. That's kind of a baller way to go to heaven. But there was this belief that Elijah would come back and prepare the way for the Messiah. So they're like, well, then you're Elijah? He's like, wrong. They're like, okay, well, how about, are you, are you a prophet? Like Moses, all the way back early in the Old Testament, had promised that a prophet would come. We now know that he was referring to Jesus, but Jews had begun to believe that there was a special, like, end-of-time figure who would be this prophet. They're like, well, if you're not the Christ and you're not Elijah, then surely you're the prophet. And John is like, no, wrong again. So look at what John clearly says. In John chapter 1, verse 20, it says, he confessed and did not deny but confessed. So this is, this is the text's way of saying, John wants it to be very, very clear. Here's what he confessed, I am not the Christ. Remember what I said, the greatest lives are marked by the greatest clarity. Greatness requires clarity on who you are and who you aren't. John was very clear, let me tell you who I'm not. I am not the Christ. Now I want you to just think, what is John saying when he declares that he's not the Christ? Think of everything he's saying in those few words. He's saying, look, let me just be clear, I'm not God. I'm not the one who can rescue you. I'm not your long-awaited king. I'm not the one that all of history has been pointing to. I'm not the one that you have been hoping for, waiting for, or praying for. I don't deserve any of your worship. I can't change your life, and I am just a guy. That's what he's saying. He was clear on who he was and who he wasn't. Are you clear on who you are and who you aren't? I want to just invite everyone now to say the words that John said. I just want to invite everyone out loud to declare, I am not the Christ. Does everyone say that out loud on three? I know that this is super weird, but let's just lean into it together on the count of three. One, two, three. I am not the Christ. How freeing is that? Some of y'all desperately need to just own that. 
that you're not the Christ. Why do I say that? I say that because you're, you're super stressed out feeling like you need to hold your world and everyone else's world together because your parents are going through a divorce, your friend is depressed, and another friend is making super compromising decisions, and you believe that it is all on you to hold your life and their lives together. Here's the great news, you're not the Christ. That doesn't mean you do nothing, it just means you do what you can. But then you've got to trust that God will be God because there's only one and you're not him. Some of y'all need to just own the fact that you're not the Christ because you're drowning in, in insecurity because you perpetually feel like a failure. Because you look at other people and you look on social media and, and you let the world tell you who you are supposed to be. You're supposed to be amazing at everything. You're supposed to never sleep and take 18 hours and be an amazing friend, an amazing boyfriend or girlfriend, and be involved in 10 student organizations and make a 4.0 and be really funny and get lots of followers and become an influencer and get a crazy amazing job where you can change the world. And so you live under the banner of failure because you're not those things. Here's the great news. You're not the Christ. You have limitations. You can't do whatever you put your mind to. Some of y'all need to hear that you're not the Christ because you are crushing life. And you are amazing at everything and you've got the 4.0, and you've got the girl, or you've got the guy, and everyone loves you, and let's be honest, you're probably gonna make tons of money post-college. And so you don't need God because you kinda are a God. And the hardest, the biggest hurdle that you're gonna have to overcome in your life is coming to the place where you realize that there is only one God and you're not Him. And to just own the fact that you have limitations and you are, you're not the Christ. Are you clear on who you are and who you aren't? It was very helpful for me to come to the realization of who I am and who I'm not. Because look at what I'm doing right now. I am standing on a stage with a microphone under spotlights and there's about 3,000 people listening to me. Do you know what that can do to a person? Usually when people are doing this, they're doing it for what? For fame, for worship, to sell something. And so there was this moment in my life where I had to get clarity on who I am and who I'm not. Like, I am not the Christ. And that was so freeing for me to realize. Do you know what I, who I am? Like, what I do for a living is I stand up on stages and I teach the Bible to people. Do you know what realization I came to of who I am? I am simply a spiritual mailman. Like, that's, if you want to know what Timothy Atik does for a living, I am a spiritual mailman. Like, this is a letter from God to you. It is a love letter from heaven, from your maker, to you. I didn't write it. This is not my mail. This is not my letter. I am simply the guy who delivers it to you. Now let me ask you, when's the last time you took a selfie with your mailman? When's the last time you saw your mailman walking down the street and you were like, oh geez, oh man, here he comes, oh gosh. So you walk up to the door and you kind of wipe your pitters, like when's the last time like your mailman was about to put the mail in the slot, and then you open the door and you're like, I really like how you give me my mail. <laughs> um, you changed my life the way that you give me my mail. Can we? Like, when's the last time you did that? Never. Why? Because he or she is just the mailman. They are just the one delivering the mail. But you know what? You know what is the temptation doing what I do? It's to care what you think about how I deliver God's mail. Did you like how I delivered it? 
It's not my letter. I just want to know. I just care about whether you like how I handed it to you. It's just good for me to come to a place where I realize, look, I'm not the Christ. Like, I don't change anyone's life. Like, I just take the letter from heaven and I seek to give it to you. But this is really about you understanding the love that the God of the universe has for you. This has nothing to do with you liking me. And so I've gotten clarity on who I am and who I'm not. I'm just a spiritual mailman. That's it. John had clarity on who he wasn't. He was not the Christ, but then he had clarity on who he was. Look at verse 23 again. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. It's interesting, the wording. Do you see the wording? He says, I'm a voice. It's as if he's saying, look, I don't need to be seen. I just need to be heard because I don't need to be seen because I don't need people looking at me. This, this ultimately isn't about me. I just need them to hear what I'm trying to say because I'm trying to direct their gaze to someone else. He says that I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, when a king would travel to a region, his route would be planned and prepared, and people would go before the king and clear out of the way anything that would hinder the king's travel and arrival. So this is John the Baptist just saying, look, a king is coming. I'm definitely not the king. I'm just the guy clearing out the path so that the king can come through and you can behold the king. So when I talk about greatness and I talk about you having clarity on who you are and who you aren't, I'm just talking about having the same realization that John the Baptist had. What John realized is, is look, that he's not the lead character in the story. He's not the leading role. There is one who is, and it's, it's Jesus Christ. The story is all about Jesus. Everything in the story of all of creation and all of history is pointed at Jesus. It's not about you. It's not about me. We are in the story, and we have a part to play in the story, but ultimately, we are not the focus of the story. What is our part to play in God's story? It is to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. That is why you exist. You might not believe that. You might not want that to be true. But I'm just telling you, the reason you have been put on this earth, the reason you have oxygen in your lungs is to know Jesus and to make him known. It's like this. I've got my iPhone with me. I always have it with me. Why does the iPhone exist? It exists to put the world at your fingertips, right? Like it exists for you to talk to anyone in the world at any time. You can see them face to face. You can access information instantly. Now I can live like the iPhone exists for a different purpose. I can flip it over and say, you know what? This is a great thousand dollar coaster. Oh my gosh, like there will be no rings on this table. You know why? Because I got this sweet coaster. Or I could be like, you know, this table's kind of wobbly. I can just jam this iPhone under it and be like, you know what, that was the perfect height to balance out the table. I can live as if the iPhone exists for a different purpose, but it doesn't change the fact that the iPhone will be most fully functioning when, it was, when it's doing what it was made to do. It's the same with you. You can live as if you exist for a different purpose. You can live as if you exist to crush life and make tons of money and to sleep with a bunch of girls or a bunch of guys, or you can live as if you exist to conquer fantasy worlds through gaming platforms, but it doesn't change the reality that you will be most fully alive when you find yourself doing what you were made to do, which is to know Jesus Christ and to make him known. So greatness requires clarity on who you are and who you aren't. Number two, the second thing you need clarity on is this. Greatness requires clarity on who Jesus is and who he isn't. Do you have clarity on who Jesus is and who he isn't? Look at what it says in verse 24. It says, now they had been sent from the Pharisees and they asked John, then why are you baptizing? If you're neither the Christ nor Elijah nor the prophet... And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you don't know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. 
These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. Did you see the wording that John used? He said, he says that the one that is coming after him is the one whose sandal he's not worthy to untie. There was this superficial belief that if in the first century that if you were older, then you were worthy of more honor. And here's John's point. Jesus might have showed up after me. They were actually relatives, and John was about six months older. Jesus might have showed up after John, but John's point is, I'm not even worthy to perform a task that was reserved only for slaves. Why? Because John was clear on who Jesus was. Jesus was the coming king. Not just any king. Jesus is, according to the scriptures, he is the king of all kings. Colossians 1.16 says that all things have been made by Jesus and for Jesus. Philippians 2 says that Jesus Christ has been given the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's what I'm talking about. John realized that Jesus wasn't just significant. He realized that Jesus was preeminent. You know what preeminence means? It means taking first place. And so I hope you don't miss this. If you're tuned out, tune in. To make Jesus a part of your life, but not the point of your life, is to waste your life. See, one thing that I know, and I've worked with college students for a long time, I gave my 30s to investing in college students. And what I saw, and I experienced it when I was a student at Texas A&M University, like my tendency in college students' tendency is to overcommit themselves. And so I remember spending time with college students who would have said yes to four, five, six different student organizations. And so what happens is, is you're spread so thin, you're not fully invested anywhere because you're trying to be invested everywhere. And so your tendency in college is to just make Jesus one more thing. It's like you've got your fraternity or sorority, and you've got a bunch of other student organizations that you've said yes to. On top of that, you're trying to work out like crazy and make great grades, and then you've just got Jesus over here. See, John had clarity on who Jesus was. He wasn't just significant. He wasn't just a part of things, he was the point of things. He wasn't just significant, he, he's preeminent. But then John goes on and says this in verse 29. It says this, the next day he, John, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who reigns before me because he was before me. So do you see what's happening here? John is just showing that he has great clarity on who Jesus was because he sees Jesus walking and what does he say? He says, look, don't miss it, behold. And then he calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That might be foreign terminology to you, but when John refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he's referring to this practice in the Old Testament. When the nation of Israel, they were captives or slaves to Egypt, and God rescues the Israelites out of Egypt, but in doing so, he asks the Israelites to slaughter a lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and to paint it on the doorposts of their homes. And the angel of death sweeps through Egypt, and any time the angel of death sees the blood painted on the doorposts of a home, the angel of death passes over that home and whoever is in it lives. When John says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he is referring to Jesus as the one who, when you know him, the one who died on a cross, his body was broken, his blood was shed for you and for me. He's the one who conquered death, rising from the dead. When you put your trust in him, when you receive Jesus into your life, it's like you Pass over your life. 
I just want to be really clear right now on why I believe that every person in this room is desperate without Jesus Christ. And if you're here this week and you don't know Jesus personally, or maybe you think you do, and you're about to get clarity that you don't, let me tell you why I believe that every person, including myself, in this room is desperately in need of Jesus. I want you to think of it like this. If you're tuned out, please tune in. This is so important. Don't miss it. I want you to think about it. If, if there is a God, God has to be perfect, right? Right? This is just logic. If there is a God, he has to be perfect because if he's not perfect, what qualifies him to be God? And if there is a God and he is perfect, then his place, heaven, has to be perfect, right? Otherwise, why would you want to go to heaven? If heaven is imperfect just like earth, then heaven is no different than earth. So if God is perfect and heaven is perfect, then we have to deal with the reality that every person in this room is imperfect. Like, I don't know if that connects with you, but I'm standing up here this morning just very clear. I am imperfect. There are times that I say things I shouldn't say. There are times I do things I shouldn't do. There are times where I'm rude to people when I shouldn't be rude to people. I am an imperfect person. And every person in this room is imperfect. So here's the thing. If God is perfect and heaven is perfect, then how do imperfect people get to spend eternity in a perfect place with a perfect God? It doesn't make sense. Use logic. Like if an imperfect person goes to live in a perfect place, that perfect place becomes imperfect because there is now something imperfect in that perfect place. So here's the question. What can you do as an imperfect person to make things right with a perfect God so that you can spend eternity with a perfect God in a perfect place? Nothing. Nothing. Because no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you do, no matter how many Sundays you make it to church, no matter how many times you pick up the Bible and read it, no matter how many times that you get on your knees and pray, you will always be imperfect. So what can you do? Nothing. That is why You desperately need Jesus because when you could do nothing, God did everything. The perfect God left heaven and came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. A perfect God actually took on flesh, put on skin, became a human being, and yet he lived the perfect life that you and I couldn't live. And then when he died on the cross, he was dying for all of your imperfection and all of my imperfection. And then when he rose from the dead, it was a display that he had actually conquered all of your imperfection and all of mine. And when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, do you know what happens? Here's the crazy thing. When you receive Jesus Christ into your life, Jesus takes all of your imperfection and gives you his. Now, what am I saying when I say that? Am I saying you become a perfect person? No. What I'm saying is, is that the perfection of Jesus gets credited to your account in such a way that when a perfect God looks at you, do you know what he sees? He sees Jesus. He sees the perfection of Jesus. That's how imperfect people can spend eternity in a perfect place with a perfect God. Why? Because that perfect God does something so significant, so miraculous, that his perfection in some miraculous way becomes your perfection, even though you will live an imperfect life this side of eternity. Have you understood who Jesus is and what he's done? Do you have clarity? He's the Lamb of God who who takes away the sins of the world. John had clarity on who Jesus was and who he wasn't. Now, I would imagine that many of you here in this room have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so you have clarity intellectually on who Jesus is and what he's done and what I just shared with you about the good news of Christianity. You've already known it for a while. And yet God brought you here this week so that you could begin seeing clearly again. Look at what it says in verses 31 through 34. 
John the Baptist says, I myself did not know him, did not know Jesus. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Do you see what that's saying? He's saying, look, I didn't, I didn't really know Jesus. I was doing something kind of in faith, not knowing the person that I was coming to reveal. Verse 32, John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself didn't know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen, and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Do you see what John the Baptist is saying? He's saying, look, there was, this, there was a time where I didn't, I didn't know who I was looking for. And then there was this moment where something really crazy happened, where this dove, the Spirit of God, was descending like a dove from heaven and it rested on Jesus. And it was like God whispered to me, that, yeah, the, the one you're seeing with your eyes, that's him. That's the one that all of history has been pointing to. He's the one that you came to proclaim. And seeing Jesus clearly led to greater ministry for John. The reason I say that to you is if you're here this morning and you already have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the question is this, are you seeing Jesus clearly? Because you might be clear on who he is and who he isn't intellectually. But are you clear on who he is and who he isn't practically? Spiritual blindness is simply seeing Jesus without being captivated by his goodness or compelled to worship him. So let me just ask you, is that, is that you? Like when was the last time you were captivated by the goodness of Jesus? It's kind of like this, like nobody's love story in And if you end up getting married, you know what question you're going to get asked all the time? How'd you guys meet? Do you know what no one in the world's story is? No one's story is, you know what, when we were in college, we passed each other Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We just passed by each other. And I looked at her, and she looked at me, and there were times I was like, hey, and now we've been married for 30 years. That's no one's story. No one falls in love from just two second glances with no communication. Like at some point, you've got to stop and say, hey, we should hang out. Like we should go out. We, you, like you go somewhere. You order food. Like you look at each other. You talk to each other. You get to know one another. And some people here, you are so busy and distracted that you're just glancing at Jesus. And your love for Jesus feels low because you're trying to live off of glances. You have to move from glancing at Jesus to gazing at Jesus. Because when you gaze at Jesus, you begin to see him in a new way. And it drowns out the distractions. And Jesus goes back to taking first place in your life. So my encouragement to you is if you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, maybe God brought you here this week to just say, look, it's time to stop glancing and it's time to start gazing. Like we live in a culture where people are trying to expedite intimacy with God. It's like, hey, for only five minutes a day, you can read the Bible in three years. Well, why do you have to only read it for five minutes? It's like, you know what? Like we've got We've got apps that'll play the Bible for you and you can put it on double speed so that you can get it done as fast as possible. What relationship works like that? Like if I were to stand up here and be like, you know what, I spend three minutes a day with my wife and we've got a great marriage. Like I should look at her. I'm like, what's up? How's your day been? Good? Everything good? I'm good too. We good? Great, good. That's not how intimacy works. Maybe God brought you here just so that you could simply hear, hey, What if you sat with him until you began to see him? So the greatest lives are marked by the greatest clarity. Number one, you need clarity on who you are and who you aren't. Number two, you need clarity on who Jesus is and who he is. And then finally, greatness requires clarity on what you were put on earth to do. Greatness requires clarity on what you were put on earth to do. Look at what verses 35 through 37 says. It says, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus, and as he walked by, 
He said, behold, the Lamb of God. Watch this, verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. So picture what's happening here. In first century, there were people who followed people. Not like on social media. Like they literally like left everything, and they just walked where they would walk. They would go where they would go. They would listen to what they were saying, and they would do what they were doing. So there's two people who have been following John the Baptist, and then when Jesus shows up, John's like, hey, behold the Lamb of God. And those people who have been following John leave John and start following Jesus. How countercultural is that today? Like John is trying to get rid of followers. We live in a world that's trying to cultivate and gain followers But here's the reality. When John saw Jesus, he wanted other people to see Jesus. Why? Because he knew what part his was to play in God's story. Here's the reality. Until you see Jesus, you will live to be seen like Jesus. What do I mean by that? I just mean you're going to want to be seen as significant. You're going to want, you're going to desire fame and influence. You're going to want people to follow you and admire you and respect you and look at you and say, you know what? You are enough and your life is better than my life and you're crushing life in a way that I can't crush life. Until you see Jesus, you're going to want to be seen like Jesus, but... Once you see Jesus, you'll want nothing more than for others to see the same Jesus. And so I'll explain it like, like this. Um, several years ago, I found myself getting interested in the Tour de France, which is this bike race that's over 2,000 miles long. There's a documentary on Netflix, which is pretty captivating. Probably not a lot of people here into the Tour de France, but I'm kind of into it. The deal with the Tour de France is it is a team sport. I mean, you ride for over 20 days, for over 2,000 miles, and it is impossible to win the race on your own. Like, it is a team sport. And so the crazy thing about it is that each team chooses a leader. And once that team chooses its leader, Everyone else on that team now rides for that person to win. That means no one else on the team is trying to win. Everyone is riding so that that person can win. And there's this term in cycling called the domestique. The domestique is the title of a person on the team that rides over 2,000 miles for the sole purpose of the leader winning. So if the leader is riding and gets a flat, do you know what the domestique does? The domestique rides up, gets off of his bike, gives his bike to the guy with the flat so that he can keep going. That's what the domestique does. The domestique will ride in front of the leader to block all of the wind and he will spend all of his energy until he gets the leader as far as he can get him, and then the domestique falls off, and he goes to the back of the pack, and his goal is just to finish. The domestique rides for someone else's fame, for someone else's glory, for someone else's success. See, John came to a point where he realized he was the domestique. He existed for someone else's fame. What's interesting is several years ago, I was watching the Tour de France, and there were these commercials that came out for Team Astana. Because Team Astana didn't know who their leader was going to be. It was either going to be Lance Armstrong, this is prior to scandal, or Alberto Contador. And so these commercials would be like, is it Armstrong or Contador? Who's it going to be? Who's going to be the leader. And we live with that same type of wrestle every day. We don't realize it, but it's like, who's it going to be? Jesus or me today? Like today, am I going to live as if Jesus exists for me or as if I exist for Jesus? Like, am I going to live as if I just need Jesus to bless what I want to do? Or am I going to live a life that blesses Jesus every single day? 
We are the domestique. We exist for the fame of Jesus. We exist to make him great. See, greatness is the result of settling the question of who is writing for who. A guy named Francis Chan, he said, the point of your life is to point to him. Whatever you're doing, God wants to be glorified because this whole thing is his. It's his movie, his world, his gift. So I hope you don't miss what I'm telling you right now. Do you know what the greatest waste of a life is? The greatest waste of a life is being very successful at doing the wrong thing. It's the greatest waste of a life, being super successful at doing the wrong thing. Some people here, you're going to spend your life building sandcastles. Like you're going to spend your life, all of your energy, you're going to become a workaholic and you will leverage everything you have. You will sacrifice your marriage or your kids for the sake of accumulating and accomplishing. And you're going to spend all your days building the same castle. And the day you die, the tide of life is going to come and wash that same castle away. And someone else is going to move onto the same plot of land and just start building their same castle. And no one's going to remember you were even there. Like, that is so depressing. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because you can realize today why you exist. You exist to know Jesus and to make him known. I'll finish just by reading the verse that we started with. Jesus says in Matthew eleven eleven, he says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. For Jesus, John the Baptist was the goat. But then look at what Jesus goes on to say. He says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So this is interesting because Jesus is saying, look, there is a goat, John the Baptist, but you know what? It is possible to be even greater than the goat. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, The one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying, look, John the Baptist was the last person to come saying, the king is coming, the king is coming. But we sit on the other side of the death, burial, and resurrection. So we get to look and say, the king has come. The king has come. He has come. He has died. And he has conquered your sin. He's conquered my sin. And he has made a way when there was no way. He has kicked open the door of heaven. And he has made a way for imperfect people to be right with a perfect God and to spend eternity in a perfect place. Not because of anything we would do, but all because the king has come and conquered for you and for me. So what's true greatness? It's living with clarity that you are not the Christ, but the Christ has come and wants a real, enjoyable, eternal relationship with you. I'm not inviting you into religion today where it's like, okay, great, let me just sign you up for a bunch of religious activities. No, I'm, I'm asking Do you want a real relationship with the creator of the universe? Live with clarity. You're not the Christ, but you've been made for a relationship with the true Christ. Jesus is the goat, the greatest of all time. So sit with him until you see him. And then finally, my hope is that college campuses would be changed because the Spirit of God does something so significant in your life this week that you see Jesus clearly and you go back to school wanting others to see Jesus. And you live a life that doesn't say, look at me, you live a life that declares, look at him. And so I just wanna ask you right now, if you'll pray with me, And I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to whatever God might be wanting to do in your life today. If you're here this morning and and you're getting clarity for the first time on who Jesus is and what he's done for you, and you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time in your life, you want to 
put your trust in him. You want everything he's done to make a way for you into a relationship with God. If you want to put your trust in Jesus Christ today, just with eyes closed, I want to ask you to slip your hand up real quick so I know exactly who I'm talking to in this room right now. If that's you, if you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's you, I just want to ask you to put your hands down and I, I invite you to pray these words. This isn't a rabbit's foot prayer. It's just you telling God what you know to be true. Would you just pray and say, Lord Jesus, would you come into my life today? Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. Thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the dead for me. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sins? And would you lead me in a new life? Just tell him, say, Jesus, I give my life to you today. And if that's you, if, if you just invited Christ into your life, hey, welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the family of God. What the Bible would say is that you walked in here dead and you're going to leave here alive. Welcome to the family of God. And maybe you're here this morning and you're just not there yet. You're not ready. You, you're still skeptical. That's okay. But my encouragement is to explore Jesus. If he is who we've said he is this morning, and it's possible that you are desperately in need of him, then the best thing you can do is devote all, every ounce of your being to exploring him. So I want to encourage you right now, just in the quietness of your own heart, to just pray a prayer and say, Lord Jesus, help me to see you. Help me to see you. Give me clarity this week. And then if you already know Jesus, and maybe you've just been glancing at him, and you're realizing this morning you need to just gaze at him, my encouragement is just to take a few minutes, even right now, to just sit, to be with him, to enjoy the presence of God in this place to fix the eyes of your heart on Jesus and to just be captivated by his beauty in a new and fresh way. Lord Jesus, I do pray that. I pray that we would be a people who see you clearly, that we would live with great clarity in who you are and who you aren't, that we would live with great clarity that we are not the Christ. And my hope and prayer is that 3,000 college students would go back to their campuses and live lives that declare, look at Jesus, because he is good. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.